Hippie Podcast. I'm your host, The Sensible Hippie. Today, we're embarking on a fascinating journey through ancient biblical narratives, mysteries, and prophecies that have left an indelible mark on our world. Today, we have an extraordinary guest, a true luminary in the realm of biblical mysteries. He is the best selling author of a book you may have already heard of. The Genesis 6 Conspiracy. He's a dedicated researcher who has passionately explored the deep truths hidden within biblical tales. His work has led him to uncover fascinating connections between fairy origins, dragon bloodlines, the giants that once walked on this earth, fallen angels, and shedding light onto the coming last days. And that's only the tip of the iceberg. Our guest today is none other than Gary Wayne, also known as the Contrarian, for his fearless, unconventional insights on biblical truths. So whether you're a seasoned biblical scholar or just searching for deeper understanding, be prepared to be enlightened. So let's welcome Gary Wayne to the Sensible Hippie Podcast. Welcome, Gary. No, no problem. Uh, I, I like to do uh, new audiences, so I'm always looking forward to whether it's large, small, but just to hit an audience that may not have heard me before because, uh, you know, I want to get information out because I think the world kind of needs to be able to understand what's going on, and I think I present a pretty good way of explaining things maybe a little hard to accept at first but when people start to think about it it starts to make a lot of sense to them it it does so many things that you've talked about really just made me open my eyes a lot more than before um i did i never was raised in a religious Mm -hmm. background at all i i did after i got an adult went into um religion but um, kind of step back now. And when you step back, you kind of see the whole picture. Yeah, I mean, you do get a better perspective from on high. So it's yeah. uh, it gets, otherwise you sort of get lost within the trees or within the things that are going on. And you don't always get enough time to sort of think about things. And you're so busy, you just sort of keep sort of moving on. So for me, it was um, a little bit different. I, I grew up in a, a Christian a household in in a church, but as I got into to be a teenager, I kind of left that whole ideology. Went with the peer groups and the teachings in the schools and the brainwashing that goes on. And then uh, once I got challenged to uh, maybe have a look at my views, uh, I won't go through the whole story, but you know that was a lot of cognizant dissonance on many different occasions. Is am I really ready to? go down this rabbit hole and who's going to believe me even if it was true who would believe me so I had to deal with a lot of that on the way back because being a Christian doesn't necessarily as as we're aware of doesn't necessarily uh, imply that people are aware of everything that's in the Bible and the whole context of the Bible in terms of why we're here where we were and where we're going so And it's not taught in the churches, so unless people are seeking those answers out themselves because they're not happy with the unanswered questions, then uh, they tend to skip over it and just sort of keep saying, oh, well, it's not important. True. And you started this journey like 30 years ago? Yeah, more than that, more like 40 years now. (laughs) (laughs) I I mean, so... Yeah, about 1980 or 1981. So that's when I was challenged to read, you know, we were drinking on a Friday night, having beers. I'm like 20 or 21 years old. And I was challenged to read a book if I had the courage. I'm thinking, I have no idea what kind of book it was. And because then they've been talking a few things about a false prophet and antichrist. And I thought, well, this is kind of interesting because there was antichrist movies out there. And I thought, okay, you know, this is 
not that unusual, but uh, we can talk about that. That's fine. We're having beers. They gave me the <laughs> challenge. They said, if you got enough courage, read this book by Hal Lindsey. It was called The Late Great Planet Earth, and it was a book on prophecy. So I read it, and he was way ahead of his time on prophecy. He uh, wrote many books, um, and so it scared the socks off of me. And I had to start to reconcile that, because if it was true... And if this was indeed, and as he, he called it in one of his books, the terminal generation, then I needed to know a little bit more about this because it has obviously an impact. And, but, you know, I had no idea where to start. So, I mean, you just start right from the beginning. First thing you have to do is you have to read the whole Bible. And, uh, you know, that was a good thing to do because I'd never run it read it from front to back we only did verses and churches and things and so i found the old testament really difficult um and you know i had to switch to a modern translation because the kgv was making my mind go to mush after about a page <laughs> <laughs> and then i you know I, I used other versions and the kgv afterwards but to sort of be able to read it and have it make some sense to me and, but, you know, by the time I got to the four gospels, it was, this is not normal. This is preternatural. The words are uh, not from a human. And so I started to pay a little bit more attention. And then I decided well, I have to go back and I have to log all the narratives of prophecy because, you know, reading it. The whole book had it did not allow me to find out whether or not Hal was in context, manipulating scripture, living out inconvenient scripture, or anything like that. So, you know, I get out a highlighter and I got to start all over because I ran out of colors pretty darn fast because there's <laughs> way more prophecy in the Bible than what one thinks. And uh, so then I had to learn about, you know, setting up files and it was all done manually at that time. So I just hand wrote the verses down, what they were about, put them in files, I had to create more files because there's again, way it was just, <laughs> I was just blown away as how many prophecy trails there are. And in that process, as you're going back and restarting and reading and researching, you know, you get to Genesis six pretty quickly, no matter how you come about in that sort of process. And it's like, I don't want to have anything to do with that. Whatever that is, that's not what I'm here for. I don't, giants, what the heck is that all about? So anyways, I, I kind of left it for a while. And then as I was going back to go through to make sure that I was getting everything, I thought, you know what, I'm going to go through it anyways. I might as well log everything about giants. And there was way more passages than I thought. And even at that time, there was even more than I didn't even realize we're talking about giants and demons and angels and fallen angels and how that seemed to sort of come together to a certain degree in the end time. So that's how I got into it. And I didn't start thinking about writing a book until about 1995, um, maybe 94, really thinking. But so I thought finally, you know, I'll write a short book. <laughs> and I thought I'll connect Genesis 6 with Revelation and I'll see whether I can tell the story and whether or not it might be worthy enough to publish when would people buy it and then would they would they like it or, you know, what would the response be? So I did that. I did that rather quickly. Ten chapters is basically what I did. And uh, then I realized that I knew there were connections to other cultures and i was a history buff and a mythology buff before so oh. i knew they were talking about the same events in prehistory wow. and as i was going to learn the same things about through history and then into end time prophecy so i thought well i'll layer that in because i think christians might want to know that Perhaps there's a polytheist version from a polytheist lens that talks about the same events that actually by doing so gives credibility to the Bible's version because it's stated over and over and over. And as, as I did further research, it's, you know, the flood story and prehistory, these yeah. things, it's on all continents all over the world and they're telling the same yeah. story from a different sort of biases and even in the hawaiian islands where um you live there's a there's a version of the uh, uh of the flood story and uh, and 
I actually have a, a memento on it. I hang it on my wall somewhere where it's a Hawaiian uh, Noah <laughs> and family. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, so, <laughs> uh, so anyways, yeah, that's sort of how I got into the larger sort of book because then I realized I need to learn a little bit more about the religions, more about the culture to give the proper context. And then that led me to how the secret societies were created through mm the mystical religions to develop the <laughs> knowledge cult. And uh, once I got into that rabbit hole, I was down there for like eight or, eight or 10 years and you could stay down there forever. There's just so much on it uh, that's out there. If you, if you really get into, you know, the research of looking for it, but I finally said, you know, I got to come back up because I have to sort of make sense of this. And then I started piecing it all together and in between these chapters all the way through and then looking for additional sources to back up what I was maybe only had one source on and stuff like that. So, yeah, so started at, say, 1990, you know, five-ish or so and uh, was really starting to do the writing by about 96, 97 and uh and didn't publish till about 2015 but i was had it ready a couple of years before but you learn very quickly it's one thing to write a book it's another thing to get published yeah that must have been hard too because i don't know if people are thinking about this kind of stuff you kind of brought it a lot of it out well it, as it turns out and i wasn't all that was i wasn't looking for christian verification from other researchers um so i wanted to learn all about prophecy myself and then when i got into the history i took the same sort of approach so i wasn't sure how much was out there what i did learn though is is even though there was this community the sort of like the fringe community in christianity that was saying hey you know we're actually do look at the literal understanding and therefore there has to be these giants and they had a big impact it was very superficial i thought and didn't really tell the whole story or how it interconnected with our history and our future so i think that's what made my book so unique um and I think it's, and, you know, and I said I would never write a sequel to the, to the yeah, Genesis I know. 6. I heard you say that. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm actually 300 pages into another book when I finally get convinced that, you know, the thirst amongst Christians is so strong and they get no yeah. answers from the churches. And None. they, if you ask the questions, they say, don't ask the questions. You continue to ask the questions. They say you should leave. So the, I decided I should listen to my audience, and it, they want to know more about what's in the in um, in the Bible about giants and about the angelic order, about the hybrid giants, yeah. and how does that connect in with end time prophecy? Because they they know they don't know how much it does, but they know there's there's terms that are used in prophecy that always go back to prehistory and. Uh, it kind of always surprised me once I got out there that people didn't really seem to understand what I thought was a pretty basic concept when I first sort of read the Bible is that the creation of the Adamites was the resolution to the angelic rebellion. And that we're going to be interconnected with that rebellion all throughout our history until that's resolved in the end time. And yet people were kind of saying, yeah, we know about angels, but there's other stuff. I don't know what you're talking about. And exactly. so, and it's been hidden from us and it's that hidden mm -hmm. history that we need to understand. So when I wrote the second book and I won't talk too much about that at this point <laughs> it goes with it, but so the only thing I guaranteed about the second book, it would be, go, it would go deeper into the Bible than anybody okay. else does. And it wow. would do research nobody else has done or has wow. presented in a logical way and that it would be shorter. So I think I've, <laughs> I think I've done that. It's only 84 chapters, Wow! <laughs> <laughs> but what it does is it connects prehistory to end time prophecy by going through the prehistory, giving you the angelic order in terms terms of the hierarchy and the fallen gives you all the terms all the giant nations all the hybrid nations goes through all of the giant wars 
And by identifying those key things of prehistory, it helps to define the terminology that's used in end-time prophecy to give you a better meaning. And then I, what I also do is, because I, I learned that there's so many different approaches to prophecy out there that all seems to be all seem to be working from a preconceived conclusion and then try and slot everything in and what doesn't they just uh -oh. ignore um pretend it's not there and you only get into conflicts when you have a preconceived conclusion so i i i talk about my approach to prophecy in the preface and then i'll show that in the uh the last parts the last couple sections of the book to show you that there is a chronology and there's a template that you can use and once I got onto that template in my prophecy research, it was, I didn't have a problem with conflicts anymore. It, everything just sort of fit. And there was a, a number, a period of time where I kept saying, okay, I missed this, I missed this, where does it fit? And it was like, oh, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. It goes right there. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I wonder if that's God kind of allowing you to see this. You know what I mean? Like towards the end there, he. Yeah, I don't want to overplay my role in interaction yeah. with, with God in any sort of manner because I'm not a prophet and I don't get visions and stuff like that. But I, I, I certainly do believe that if I have any special or good understanding of the Bible mm -hmm. and prophecy and scripture in general, then it's because I'm permitted to have that. That's a gift exactly. that's given to me. Yeah. And uh, as difficult as it is, because it makes you a contrarian within the community <laughs> and you're always yeah. challenging the status <laughs> quo. And uh, even if you can present all the evidence that opposes the standard dogma, a lot of people still won't be convinced. And again, you have to accept that. And all you, all you can do is sort of plant seeds. So, yep. you, know, you know, what I say is I'm not here to change your view on the Bible. I'm not here to change your view on eschatology. Mm -hmm. But if you want to have things start make sense, I'll provide some information that maybe is going to be helpful to you in that. And again, specifically with prophecy, if you're tired of having somebody say you can't use that verse or they reimagine it not to be relative <laughs> or they want to change what Jesus said or whatever the excuse they want to use, if you're tired of that as the comeback when you ask a specific question on a specific eschatology, esch eschatology approach, then maybe it's simpler than what they're trying to do. And uh, uh, so I provide that in the book, and we can talk about that in the, in the interview if you want. But wherever you want to go with the show is uh, whatever your audience is looking for or whatever you would like to have answered, that's what I'm here for. Well, I also like to know what where you would like to take the interview as well. I mean, I think that's important too. Um, I, I like to hear about the... Um, the dragon line, the end time, the elf line. I, I know, I know you've talked about that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know. Yeah, and it's such an important concept to understand the bloodlines and the royales. And so much so that even though I talk about it in the first book, I talk about it through what the Bible will have to say on that in the second book. And so, really? yeah, so it starts to, those dots and and even more ways than what's in in the other book because a lot of times i'm just using what the other side says right because i'm letting them speak for themselves the bible tells us about a lot of this so yeah so for the audience who may not be aware of what we're talking about is in the uh, polytheist royales and let me talk about the royales first this uh, in the first book i call them rex deus or Rex Deus, depending on how you want to pronounce that, that's the kings of God. And they believe they have the divine right to rule. And so mm -hmm. they are the royals and the royal bloodlines, but it's larger than that. It's the complete elite. It's the nobility elite, because they populated the first two classes, which were of the four classes, which is standard uh, four classes around the world, everywhere and so they would populate 
populate the kings, they would populate the governments, they would populate the armies, they would populate with uh, the extended family, all of the mm. priests, and they would take, you know, own the education only for the elite, of course. Also the army, so they would, and, and all of the large business, and they would leave a small class to like blacksmiths and bakers, <laughs> just more for the service things that they didn't want to be in would, and where there wasn't any real money. And it's almost like a slave class, but it's a elevated mm -hmm. slave class. And then there's the poor and the slaves. And that's where the humans, the Adamites, work was in the slave working class and maybe a few might be in the small business enterprise class and so the royales um if you look at that word um it means roy is in old french for king and it goes back to regal rule rugal all the way back into uh, as rugal into uh, indo aryan which was the language of the giants and l uh al it's a transliteration of el which is the hebrew word for a god or an angel so when you see the the god baal that means um lord god and that's one of the ways the secret societies say that Baal is actually the God of the Bible. That is, and that's why you, you have Lord God being used in the King James Version as one of their markers um, in terms of them doing the translation, which is, again, another controversial issue. And I have documents on that. If people want to get a hold of me, I'll send you a little bit of document on that. Or some yeah. of the changes that they made. I can provide lots of information on that because I take everything back to the Hebrew and Greek. So I want to have complete understanding. You just don't go to the Hebrew and Greek and start to understand the Bible. It takes a while <laughs> to, to get into a position to sort of do that. So if we understand that that is the nobility class and that because of the sort of giant nature, they were able to usurp that both before and after the flood. They were larger, more powerful, and uh, certainly before the flood, they could multiply in significant numbers. They created, through their dynastic bloodlines, uh, allegories. And for the patriarchal bloodline, they would use essentially dragon, but sometimes it's raven. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's why you have dragons and ravens and things sort of kind of similar, and people don't really know why. Mm -hmm. um, and you can also look at that as an allegory for one of the of two kinds of the watchers from a male perspective. And so seraphim are dragons, serpent face, six wing mm -hmm. angels, part of the watcher group okay. who created most of the giants. Mm -hmm. And then the cherubim have four faces. Yeah, they have <laughs> a face of an ox or a bull. They have a face of a uh, lion. They have the face of an eagle and a face of a man. And so the eagle, as in the Anunnaki release, where you see these winged eagle-faced gods, you have the same reliefs <laughs> with the same depiction, only they have a human head. And they would take one face when they turn themselves into a physical form. So that's part of the sort of secondary allegory of understanding two kinds of watcher, or two kinds of giants created from two kinds of watchers. And they would look similar like them. So the extension of that is, is that if these eagle-faced angels created giants, they would look like them just as you have the serpentine look with the seraphim associated with the first kings and the religions and the gods, right? So you actually get these bird-faced giants in a lot of cultures around the world, like yeah. the uh, Popol Vuh with the Zabalba and the Kamazots. Oh, yeah. And the too. Yeah. And in the Tengu in Southeast Asia. Yeah. And that's the offspring of the Cherubim. So when you get into like the linemen like men of Gad, uh, and the Mo linemen of Moab or Arioch of the War of Giants, that all goes back to sort of the lion face and you yeah. know, these lion mercenaries all throughout history. So, But I digress. So anyways, the <laughs> matriarchal bloodline, because we could go down rabbit holes forever. So. 
<laughs> so the matriarchal <laughs> allegory is a fairy or an owl. Owl oh. being secondary. And okay. again, that starts to bring out much of the imagery that's in the occult, right? Because these are occult allegories for their um, demigod offspring of the you know celestial mafia or the godfathers that originally created them who have the divine right to rule granted to them by their godfathers. And so the matriarchal line is very, very important um, with the mother goddess sort of aspect, because polytheism is sort of dualistic. So as the visible representatives of the invisible ones, um, they would be representing male and female in the dualistic polytheist religions. So understanding that when they're talking about fairy tales, and we're talking mm -hmm. about the fairy bloodline, mm -hmm. This is this is a key indicator that they're telling talking about their history, for example. Okay. So, and yeah. if you look at, let's say, um, we'll use something that most people might be familiar with. So you have uh, the Holy Grail, and again, a big part of the occult as well, the Holy Grail tales, and mm. King Arthur and Guinevere. So King Arthur is son of Uther Pendragon. Oh, okay. What? And he That's becomes a... the head dragon, Pendragon, right? And he's the Tuatha okay. Du Danann of the fairy folk giants and would be essentially fair-skinned and red-haired from that mm -hmm. version with hazel eyes. And Guinevere is a fairy queen or a godmother and of the matriarchal bloodline out of uh, Ireland, as well as Tuatha de Danann. And actually, you know, essentially translates as a banshee or a, a, a spirit like a Lilith or a queen of heaven. And so th just within the King Arthur tale, you have mm -hmm. those bloodlines and oh, wow. they're representing those kinds of, of bloodlines going forward. And that they're there to bring in a new Atlantis. Really? <laughs> yeah. And they have <laughs> Knights of that. the Round Table, which is like the, the Ring Lord Table, and mm -hmm. the, the Ten Kings of the Atlantean Empire before the Flood. And they're trying to bring in the new Atlantis after the Flood. Really? Yeah. And so all the characters that are involved there, you know, the knights aren't knights. They're all kings of mm -hmm. other countries. <laughs> and, okay. <laughs> and they have bloodlines and they're part of this, this alliance. And so anywhere you start to look in the fairy tale understanding, if you understand that a fairy queen or a fairy godmother is the matriarchal bloodline and you know, you're, yeah. So if you move over even to some more of the modern versions, like you get like uh, the vampire tales, mm -hmm. just as Lilith is connected with vampires and the owl really? sort of imagery from the female as a night witch or an upier. Yeah, and and Dracula is mm -hmm. uh, means son of a dragon. A is the for a son. Yes. And it's rooted in the Greek word draconta for dragon, which means a watcher. And now you have this dragon imagery, which is that mm -hmm. patriarchal bloodline of the seraphim on the male side. Mm -hmm. And that the character that Dracula is based on is a noble Celt. A noble Tuatha de Danann, a Scythian. They're all part of the same groups of people. And he has red hair, hazel eyes, mm -hmm. pale skin, has an aversion to light, was initiated mm -hmm. in the mystery school of Solomon. And he takes his bloodline through his genealogies back to the, uh, the Agrithi uh, tribe produced by Hercules, uh, son of Zeus and alchemy. <laughs> And King Charles, yeah, King Charles is saying part of his bloodline and genealogy and heraldry goes back to Vlad the Impaler, who the Dracula character was based on. Isn't Bush supposed to be connected to? 
Um, yeah, but more <clears throat> to the Plantagenet. Oh. Um, and most of the presidents will connect their bloodlines back to the Plantagenet. The Plantagenet is the junior offshoot family through marriage of the Anjou. Oh. Oh, wow. Is there any Asian bloodlines connected to this as well? There is. They have their own They have their groupings. own? Yeah. Oh, so really? <laughs> it's, a, it's an Eastern group. And the Chinese have uh, secret societies that parallel secret societies in the West. Okay. Really? Yes. Okay. And so in the Chinese tradition, you have the dragon creator gods. These are like seraphim. Mm. Yes, they're right. very popular, yeah. the dragons over there. Yes, they are. And they were the gods. And <laughs> just as in with the Kishimaya, um, they have their main gods as feathered serpents or plume mm -hmm. serpents. These are the seraphim again. It's a standard all around the world. And just yeah. as all the demigods come from the watchers. So in the Chinese tradition, you have a tradition before the flood and then again after the flood. So again, same sort of scenario. And both before and after the flood, the Shaw people, XIA, and all of the dynasties that come are produced from the, as the offspring of these dragon creator gods. Wow. And yeah, and again, I have a great document on this that walks people through it if they want it. They just need to get a hold of me through my website, Genesis 6 Conspiracy, number 6 Conspiracy.com. And uh, until the time of the communists, that bloodline ruled. They started most of with branch um, setting up new dynasties, branch dynasties, all the kingships through Southeast Asia, including the Japanese bloodline and they have their own separate bloodline really uh, that separate they take from back. the chinese yeah but it it descends out of them but they don't really recognize much beyond a certain point so they don't have that longer history that sort of attaches mm -hmm. again i have a document on that if people want my family my mom's side is from japan yeah. so you know, i'm interested in that and i know they kind of mesh in with the chinese it's somehow. very yeah as, as a branch off so and mm. so Today you have still the Yamamoto bloodline in place in Japan, uh, which is distinct and separate from the Chinese bloodline. But with uh, President Xi, X-I, last name, uh, that's the Western branch of the old Xia dynasty, X-I-A. And he's back in power. So you have that other bloodline back in. And they have all of these secret societies that were also part of the communist movement and were also wow. you know, dominated by the Lee family, which is the other common name of the mm -hmm. Shah bloodline uh, in the various uh, spellings. And so, yeah, mm -hmm. it's the same structure everywhere around the world. Wow. And it's just, and it's not a coincidence. Yeah, it's not a coincidence. That is so strange how that is all connected like that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's important to understand. Yeah. So they all have their own story or their own, um, I guess they all want to be that part of that end time leader. Yeah. At I, the end. I'm not sure whether you or, or people in your audience are aware of what I thought was a pretty good series of movies and television shows back in the 80s and the 90s. That shows you how old I am. But it's called Highlander. Uh, oh, I vaguely and, remember that, yeah. Yeah, and it's about these warriors who are, are immortal, and they chop each other's head off, <laughs> just as you <laughs> do with giants. About the heads. Yeah. 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 Why and is that, that? By doing that, they... <laughs> They're able to take all of their energy in, and in, in the it's, it's called a quickening in there, just as a quickening is a, as sort of a transformation of the spirit, just as the King James Version Bible calls the resurrection of Jesus as a quickening of the spirit. So that's how they're sort of tying that sort of term because they like to counterfeit everything that's in the Bible. And so um, there can only be one in that movie in that series at the end that's going to rule the world and so that's okay. the ultimate sort of antichrist figure so now if you look at that with all of these different bloodlines around the world mm -hmm. 
they're working towards the same goal, mm -hmm. but only one family can be antichrist. Yeah. So there's going to be rivalries as, as that oh. sort of happens. And so, so you asked, you asked a question about the beheading, taking of the head. Mm -hmm. So you've got giants that are before the flood and you have giants that are after the flood. And one presumes some of the traits on both sides were similar because of the similar type of creation, but the giants after the flood seem to be smaller and not as mm. gifted. And, and so they're known more or less biblically as the Raphaim. Okay. As opposed to the Nephilim. Mm -hmm. And uh, Nephilim's only used three times. <laughs> Raphaim, all after the flood, is used 25 times. And they're actually shown as a tribe in Genesis 14 and Genesis 15. And it's translated as giant when you see it, except for twice in Genesis 14 and 15 as the tribe of the Raphaim. And so the root word is 7495 in the lexicon, which means to heal or doctor or physician or medicine. 7496, same spelling, Sourced in 7495 means a disembodied spirit, a she, a shed, demon, evil spirit. And 7497 is the word for giant. And wow. also sourced in 7495 as the source. Now, in the Ugaritic text, you have the in original Semitic, it's RPM, the without the vowels and the source word for Raphaim in Hebrew or Rapha as it's oh. in singular. And they're called the Rapiu and the Rapium uh, in transliterations. And these are giant demigod dynastic kings, part of the assembly of Datanu at Mount Hermon under the Baalim gods after the flood. And they're created by Baal and Ashtaroth um, to, uh, you know, restart the giants after the flood. And they have the ability to heal not only themselves, but others. And you see that sort of imagery in bloodline kings. Let's say like the Merovingian kings were known to be fisher kings, another allegory for the same thing. And they could heal, heal themselves hmm. and heal others. And uh, just so that people see how these, these things sort of work downstream and into, into those royal bloodlines without going too deep on any one subject, because I'll bore people with the details. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> well, hopefully not, but I don't want to no. get people lost and we forget about <laughs> what we're talking about. So in the execration texts of ancient Egypt, they talk about these giants and that they had this ability to repair themselves and that the, the worst death that you could have is to have your head chopped off. And that would generally tend to mean to them that they would have to maybe wander the earth, earth as disembodied spirits or even worse, go to <laughs> prison as opposed to finding their way Haiti, Jaol, and where their heaven and their gods are in their belief system. And the reason, you, the only way you can kill them by chopping off their head is because they have that ability to repair things. So if you cut off a hand, they can grow back another hand. So that strike to the neck cuts off the brain and the heart Suddenly and quickly, there's no ability to repair yourself. So the two schools of thought are, one is they can do that themselves, or they had a technology, and some speculate through the sarcophagus, and sarcophagi do that. Um, so whichever way, they were known that they uh, had that ability to heal themselves. And so that's why have, let's say, in the story that people would be most aware of in the Bible with uh, Goliath, who's mm -hmm. a, a giant, a, a, a Raphaim, um, that when David takes five smooth stones, A, he's not thinking he's going to miss. He's probably going to have to kill the five kings of the Pentapolis of the Philistines because mm -hmm. they're all giants. And so he takes five stones and he, he drops 
Goliath with the first one, which goes right mm -hmm. through the temple, which mm -hmm. you would think probably should have killed him if he was a normal being. But David doesn't leave it at that. He goes and he takes the head. Yeah, because mm -hmm. he wants to make sure that, that mm -hmm. he's dead. And mm -hmm. you uh, then he actually uh, he takes the head over to Jerusalem. And he shows this to the Jebusites as a sign of what's going to happen to them because he's already been anointed by God to become, when he grows up and after Saul dies, the king. And in the new book, I, I, I talk about this episode and that this is likely where the name, uh, the hill of Golgotha, that Jesus was crucified outside the walls of Jerusalem, got the name, and it means the hill of the skull. And then another interesting thing to show you how these bloodline kings looked on um, the power of people of that bloodline is, is in the time of Jesus uh, and King uh uh, Herod the Tetrarch, as opposed to King Herod, because King Herod had died and his offspring is, are now taking over. And in the John okay. the Baptist story, he beheaded him. And then when mm -hmm. he hears about Jesus doing the miracles in uh, the Galilee region, he thinks that that is the risen John the Baptist. Right, that's right. Yep. Because he was able to repair himself somehow, even though he <laughs> took his head. And he's an absolute fear. Like, how powerful is this guy that he could actually come back from the dead? And so, anyways, there's more biblical accounts about taking the heads. But it's a key part yeah. of the occult. And it's a key part of mm. interesting details, particularly in the Wars of the Giants uh, in the mm. Bible. Yeah, and I, I know they still do that today um they behead people is, is yeah. that for the same reason just to yeah. be sure yeah and with the mm -hmm. vampires they do be the beheading mm -hmm. and a stake through the heart they want to be yeah. fully <laughs> sure <laughs> um, what bible do you use or which which bible do you think is most accurate because the translation is not quite accurate yeah it, it it's not going to change the meaning no matter which one you use okay uh, but there are certain details that you <laughs> might walk away with a little bit different meaning. So, um, yeah, I started with NIV, also have NASB, uh, I have a King Jerusalem Bible, I do the King James, I have an Access and a few other ones. And as I was sort of wanting to go deeper into the research, and in the first book I used the NIV Bible because that's what I came back to, to Christ with, so... Um, but I wanted to get different translations because I understood the KGV, which I was struggling to read, seemed to use different words and mean a little bit different in some of the passages in the NIV. So that's why I wanted to use other translations to get sort of a triangulation or a better understanding of how it was translated out of Hebrew or to Greek. So that'll get you very you know quite far along the way but if you really want to be nerdy and you really want to know the full context of the meanings and allow you you and will allow you to open up more doors i would recommend that people get either an interlinear uh, bible online or a kgv okay. and I, I like to use the kgv because i've got all the other sort of translations and i want I want the oldest language of the KGV mm. when I'm doing research and the understanding of how the, of those older words that they use versus the modern language as mm -hmm. it goes back to the original Greek and Hebrew. And what's interesting in the meanings of Greek and Hebrew words is that they have multiple meanings. Some of them are nuanced mm -hmm. and similar, but some of them are quite different. So, you have to be a little bit careful when you're doing it that the translation that you're looking at, what you're testing for and what you would like to know if you, if you don't like the translation is, can I use this meaning, is does it fit with the meaning of the sentence? Does it fit with the chapter that it's in? And does it not contradict any other passage in the Bible if you select a different <clears throat> meaning? And that's a, that's a high standard, but that's if you want to do it properly so you don't sort of 
mislead yourselves because a lot of people they mm -hmm. pick the meaning they want yeah you know specific <laughs> sentence but it doesn't make sense with the rest of the narrative true i think you mentioned before about even um babble something simple like that people i think you said hebrew it's translated as confusion of language yep but in archaic archaic A language Acadian. Acadian, Acadian. <laughs> which was our, which is an archaic language um and then their account of the uh, tower of babel and, and people may not be aware of that babel account is has an aztec accounting of it really uh, i didn't yeah, know that yeah and a few other uh ones in central america uh it has wow. a sumerian version has an akkadian version it has several other languages but in the akkadian one um what i found was interesting is that they look at that word babel not meaning confusion of languages and it's talking mm -hmm. about this in terms of this this same ziggurat that's being built that it means bab as in a portal or a gateway and uh el not as uh we would would be b-a-b-e-l although we see it transliterated that would be B-A-B-I-L-U, which is the I-L-U is a transliteration of E-L just as A-L is just a Mesopotamian, Mesopotamian translation. So it means, in their language, a gateway of the gods or a stargate or a portal or however you want to read mm -hmm. that, maybe a wormhole. But that would indicate that there was a significant technology. Yeah that was going on at babel and it starts to make some sense it does if you look at the understanding that a ziggurat a tower and a pyramid were essentially said to be the same type of structure with the same purposes mm -hmm. in antiquity and that uh it had a technology that would go with it and it would be built on particular energy lines or ley lines as it's known in the occult today so that it could work with this technology that they're putting into it so in the other stories not necessarily written in the bible about the babel account we get more detail on how hubris nimrod was that he would actually climb the ziggurat and we understand that he's a rebel and he rebels against god mm -hmm. but now we get some of the hubris antichrist type things that he will say that he is threatening the god of the bible that if he were to bring on another flood or another apocalypse he would go into heaven and kill him building this tower well that doesn't make any sense you can't build right. mud bricks high yeah. enough or strong enough to even get out of the firmament into another dimension where heaven is and so it perhaps implies that he was going to need a technology to mm. storm heaven uh, so the other possibility is is that he is going to institute what i call enochian mysticism at babel which mm -hmm. is the root word for babylon of the end time oh really yeah just oh. as he had universal sway over all the noites at that time babylon will rule over the whole world as that mystical religion which is the religion of the nephilim and enoch son of cain who creates it before the flood and hermes finds this knowledge buried under the pyramid of uh and takes it to nimrod in the gnostic and the and masonic uh tradition of the polychronicon oh, really yeah and uh with this that. knowledge they have the knowledge to start building the city and building the tower and they initiate people into uh the mysteries there and create a you know a thousand masons to do this and he writes the first constitution for the post diluvian or after the flood masonic society he's the first really? grand master he is recognized as the first grand master after the flood and of course enoch son of cain and there's two enochs in the bible right. one son of cain one son of jared on the seth line enoch is recognized as a great patriarch and founder of the secret societies, along with some of his descendants like Tubal-Cain, Nama, Jubal, and Jabal. 
who are so you sort of get through the seven sacred sciences that they're developing some of those sciences from the biblical accounting of them so they're applying this knowledge and so if it's that knowledge that was before the flood that we're just catching up to today that is angelic technology it's incredible the, the illicit knowledge provided by the fallen angels in the book of Enoch and in all polytheist cultures around the world, um, that this had the ability to go interdimensional. And also, angels who produced the giants before the flood were taken to the abyss prison. Okay. For their crimes. Uh, the pit prison, as, as rec- and they'll come out in the end time in Revelation Are 9. They? Yeah. And that even the post offspring gods like Baal, and Baal is the mm-hmm. son of El, just as Zeus is the son of Kronos, both the, the, all the parent gods rule before the flood in polytheism, and then gods like Anli, El, and Anki are offspring gods, son of Anu in this case, or Osiris, or Baal, or Zeus, and their pantheons rule after the flood. They all create giants after the flood again and did the same crimes. <clears throat> they disappear as well, and they no longer walk amongst us, and for the same crimes on to the abyss prison as, as well. Roll that into now Nimrod's thinking. If he has this technology to go interdimensionally, he may go into another dimension to get the pit prison. So the pit prison, or the abyss prison, as some people call it, is located in Sheol or Hades, but in a separate place in there. And Sheol and Hades is also the location of the polytheist gods or their heaven. But it occupies the inner earth, but in a different dimension. So you have to have a portal to to get there so he would need that to do that now let's roll forward what happens in the end time and we just talked about nimrod as an archetypical antichrist figure so in daniel 8 10 at the midpoint of the last seven years he actually goes into heaven and he throws down some of the starry host and tramples on them some of the angels loyal to God. And that's at the same time as the war in heaven in Revelation 12, where Satan and all his armies and Antichrist has just come to power, are going to storm heaven, and Michael and his angels are going to fight back, and they're going to throw them down to the earth and keep them there for the last three and a half years. Something also happens just before Antichrist comes to power, um, and as he's ascending, to power is the pit prison in Revelation 9 is open where all of the fallen angels and all of the terrible ones of the Nephilim and the Raphaim, who some beheaded and some for just the crimes that they did, um, mm-hmm. were, were are going to come out at the same time. Is it he mm-hmm. his bed was nine cubits long and four cubits wide? So as the king of Edre and Ashtaroth. That would make the bed 16 feet long and seven <laughs> feet wide. So for him to fit into it, he's going to be a little bit shorter than that. So he's <laughs> going to be somewhere between 12 to, say, 14 and a half feet tall, and he's going to be four to five feet wide. Now, they put this bed wow. on, on, on display in Rabbah in Amman for uh, the Israelites to remember that they just weren't really? fighting taller people there okay and that it was a reminder and that the height wow. the width ratio was two to one yeah so they were wider and stockier than humans humans are like a three to one width ratio okay. and so you get this word stout that's used and words that mean stout in the old testament in the king james version that's describing these giants because stout is in muscular not as in fat. And so now we're starting, I mean, we're talking about beings that are more than twice the height and, um, you know, at least 50% wider. Yeah. Bulked with muscle and they look differently. <laughs> they have elongated skulls, right? Do they really? Oh. Yes. And, uh, and they're sutureless and they're large skulls. Yeah. 
and they have high cheekbones and these large wraparound eyes that would glow. Their voices would bellow like Atlas and it would just vibrate. And they were terrifying to look upon. Now, Yokomesh yeah. is a dark-haired giant and maybe a little bit different. And from the Sumerian region, even though there's accounts of Gilgamesh in the Ugaritic texts, which are identical, which means they were communicating even at that time. Oh. And in all of the accounts, he is 11 cubits tall, and he is four cubits wide. And he's king of Uruk, son of Lugalbanda, and a mother goddess, Nin, and he's six generation after the flood. So it's not the wow. Gilgamesh that's in the Enoch Book of Giants. That's an antediluvian giant who Gilgamesh is likely named after and that's common mm -hmm. after the flood to name giant names after giants really? before the flood yeah so like mm -hmm. Gog for example is a giant mm -hmm. after the flood Magog is as well but he's they're originally created before the flood by the parent god Iapetus who Poseidon replaces and no. so Magog <laughs> Gog and Albion were sons of Iapetus and Clito. I didn't know that. Yeah. So now you have hmm. a giant that is a king of a rook, so he'd be measured according to Josephus' standard at 21 inches on, on the cubit. He is almost 19 feet tall. Oh my god. <laughs> and he is 7 feet wide. Oh my god. And even That's if you use two stories. Yeah. And even if you use a common cubit, he's going to be 16 feet tall and change. And he's going to be uh, um, at least six feet wide, about six feet wide. Yeah. A dark hair oh giant. Oh, my God. As opposed to red hair and blonde hair of the Raphaim, mm -hmm. of the Seraphim Watchers. And I talk a little bit about this in the new book. And. Okay. He has pale skin as well, and uh, he seems to be part of the Cherubim, mm -hmm. Nephilim and Raphaim, presuming they're both created both before and after the flood. And typically, the uh, dark-haired, human-faced Cherubim would be depicted with dark hair as well. Yeah, what is it with these um, giants that are... Blonde hair, you were saying, blue yep. eyes, or yep. red hair, hazel eyes. Yep. Is that? That's from the, the seraphim, seraphim stock. Different that, watcher so angel. So there's four w groups of watcher angels. Uh, there's archangels that Michael is from and Gabriel. Um, okay. And if you get into the Book of Enoch, Uriel and Raphael and some other ones. Um, you have the cherubim. Uh, which have okay. four faces. Uh, you have the seraphim, and the seraphim work in the altar before God, and they're in charge of government and religions and mm. do edicts oh. accordingly. So in Daniel 4, when you have uh, these watchers coming from the throne of God to talk about governorship, these are the seraphim angels as watchers. And it's so the Hebrew the, word, I, ear, for watcher. So watcher does show up in the Bible four times in the book of Daniel, which are the same as the sons of God order or the watchers. Um, and that you have um, uh, the seraphim who produce offspring that will look more like them. They'll look more like humans as they start to intermarry with humans after the mm -hmm. flood. Uh, and get and that will become diluted, but they're still going to have those serpentine, elongated skulls. And if you mm -hmm. look at a Raphaim dynast bloodline, that is the most obvious to what I'm talking about, is pull up pictures or go see a King Tut museum, and okay. you see Akhenaten, and he mm -hmm. has this, either he's going to have a, without the hat, he has this huge, elongated skull. If he's got a hat on, it's a huge, elongated hat to cover the skull. Yeah. He's got these high cheekbones, these large wraparound eyes, and he's got these thin lips and this protruding chin, and you look at that face, and you're seeing a serpent hybrid mm. human face on there um that and of course the seraphim had dragon serpent face they would take on that look to be sort of just like them so yeah it seems to me you have the, those two separate strains of uh, human-like 
uh, ones. And then the cherubim also seem to have, as I said, created those other kinds of angels, as Nephilim as well. Lower class, more of a mm. warrior class, as the uh, Tengu and the lion um, mm -hmm. men are like. And you could make that same case for the dog Nephilim as well. Wow. I wonder if those seraphims that are bloodline still today, are they in the government? I'm sure they have to be. Yeah, their bloodlines still <laughs> at right? least pull the strings. And certainly the lower level yeah. bloodlines would be the ones that would be promoted to run government. Uh, you can look on the coat of arms of the royals and you're going to see things like a unicorn with a horn. Oh. That's an allegory for a cherubim. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Uh, I, I, I'm I sure covered. you'll yeah. <laughs> you see it's, a lot it, of lions. It's, yeah, it's an angelic being as well as a as a horse that the Nephilim uh, rode on into battle. Really? So two different they types really of. Had them? Yeah. They existed at one time. That's but they would have been a chimera type of creation. Right. Okay. Yeah, before the flood. And after the flood, to a certain degree, really? there's accountings of that. I cover that off in the second book oh as well. God. So, oh, cool. yeah, and you have lions, right? So that yep. goes back to a cherubim. You have these eagles. Mm -hmm. America has arms. eagles. Yeah, that goes back oh. to the cherubim. They're the ones who are thought to, and also their uh, cherubim are associated not only as a warrior class, but also supplying the wisdom, which is sort of the third eye, and the allegory oh. for the unicorn horn as the angelic being mm. that supplies that knowledge, supplies that knowledge from from the gods and that uh antichrist is described as the little horn and this unicorn uh <laughs> in in the bible oh, really yeah and the other face of course you have a human uh face and uh you also have a, a bull face so a lot of times you're going to see like the cherubs or the sphinxes that are showing a physical form uh, in with their true sort of nature of their body as opposed to taking human legs. They have, they have the ability to take any form they want uh, mm -hmm. when they come. But when they want to look like a human, they can do it with an animal, one of those four animal heads or a human's mm -hmm. head with legs or otherwise. So, uh, but you're going to see, you know, carobs uh, protecting temples uh, all around the Middle East. And they're going to either have a lion's mm -hmm. face, a human's head, a bull's mm -hmm. head or an eagle's head, so okay. it's, or a bird's head. So that's the imagery that we're see, seeing in that. Yeah. And yeah. So, and the cherubim are also the ones who pull God's chariot in the vision in Ezekiel and is described in really? the Psalms. And the other one is a very similar being to the cherubim of the four watchers. And we didn't cover the fourth one. I forgot to do that. So <laughs> while I'm on the chariot, <laughs> uh, you have uh, these wheels within wheels. Yeah, and in there, I've seen that. There's, there's a cherub, eyes. Yeah, and there's a cherub-like beings in there with all of these eyes. And they have mm. four faces, but one of them is the face of a cherub. And then the other three are similar, okay. and there's one face that's different. So... That word doesn't go back to cherubim as to what these wheel angels are, but it means you have two words in Hebrew that mean wheel. One is Gilgal, as in uh, Gilgal Raphaim, the wheel of the giants or the wheel of the spirits at the foot of Mount Hermon on the Golan Heights. And the other word is Ophan. And so the wheels that were in with wheels when it's mm -hmm. describing that, it's the Hebrew word Gilgal. Now, when it's describing the eyes and the beings within those wheels, it's Ophan. So, so they're like wheel angels, and the I am would be the male plural. What's interesting is the book of Enoch names the Ophanim as the fourth group of watchers. Oh. So biblically, we do. They just don't translate it directly out of Hebrew as Ophanim as they do with Cherubim, which is kind of silly in my books. Is like you translate Seraphim as Seraphim. Why wouldn't you 
you know, translate Ophan as the Ophan name in that case. It makes makes no sense to me. Now, in the Greek mythology, the gods rode chariots, usually with white horses, but also a lot yeah. of times they have a white horse with a single horn, a unicorn. And oh. that's, again, the occult using that allegory of a unicorn angelic being as, because these are flying horses and they don't have wings. They just have the ability to do what they do. Well, maybe they have wings. I don't know. But but this is their sort of uh, allegory of, of mixing in the unicorn and that knowledge and that third eye and the layers and layers of allegories that they have. Because there's rebellious cherubim, there's a rebellious seraphim, mm. there's rebellious angels probably of every rank and order. You know what the um, Israel war right now that's going on, is that part, you think, of this end time story to a certain degree so in the signs that jesus provided for this fig tree generation or all mm -hmm. the events that he describes is going to happen um he, he talks about uh the sorrows which are translated in layman's terms as birth pangs mm -hmm. and they include the catastrophes of war rumors of war mm -hmm. pestilence mm -hmm famine, earthquakes, and then Luke adds in the surging of the seas. And these will get stronger throughout that generation. Mm -hmm. And that even at the time of the opening of the seals, which it will be 25% destruction of all humankind at that point, and that's right at the beginning of the last seven years, people running the world the princes in revelation 6 see the damage and, and they're actually are hiding in the earth in their fortresses or caves or whatever they've built for protection um which is a common thing that people of the bloodlines and occult really? societies do they dig tunnels underneath their buildings wow. for, yeah so okay. um they think it's the day of the lord but it's not it's just the seal openings mm. And so, yeah, cause the, okay. because the trumpets are 33% destruction and the wrath bowls would be 100% except that Jesus steps in, otherwise all flesh would be destroyed. Yeah. So if we <laughs> are in the fig tree generation, I think we might be, we're going to see mm. things that look like the start of mm. these wars. So if you get to the war that happened mm. after the opening of the abyss, towards the midpoint of the last seven years, you get this great alliance that is going mm -hmm. to march on Israel. And so that's what people will always be sort of looking at. Does this lead to the Armageddon? Because this war will look like Armageddon, but still it won't be. Because right. it's in the trumpet judgment. <clears throat> and in this is the God War of Ezekiel 38 and 39. And it happens in the last days, as Ezekiel 38 talks about in that passage. And then in 39, after the war, when they're burying it, you'll have second exodus in the time of Jacob's trouble, which happens after the midpoint. So this is not the Revelation 20 war. This is two <laughs> end time markers saying that it's in the last seven years. And that is the same war as... Joel 1 and 2 versus Joel 3, which Joel 3 is Armageddon. Um, because okay. it, it's a war that follows after Joel 1 and 2. And Joel 1 and 2 has the same descriptions of this chimera type of army mm. that's in Revelation 9. And Joel 1 and 2 says, this is the largest army that ever was and never will be again. So even the Armageddon army will be smaller. Because <laughs> that happens in Joel mm. 3. And then Armageddon doesn't come till Revelation 19, mm -hmm. and part of the rolling out of the uh, bowl judgments in Reve Revelation 16 as well. But those are just the details that come in Revelation 19. And so you have in Revelation 9, after the abyss is open, and part of the three woes of the end time, you have this 200 million man army that's a chimera like army. And in the new book, I put the description of the of this army on one uh, side, and then right beside it, I give the description of the Joel one and two army, and show people that that's the same army. But where is, I guess, the people of Israel as yes. a nation? Where do they stand in prophecy to, today? 
So they're in, as Ezekiel 38 talks about, Israel is back in the land of the covenant to a certain degree. And that's the southern mm-hmm. kingdom. And so they're coming there to destroy them. Um, and in mm-hmm. Daniel 9, 27, it talks about this covenant that mm-hmm. is uh, provided and Israel will receive protection. They'll be able to start doing the sacrifices on a wing of the temple, which Islam isn't going to prevent unless there's a universal religion that's going to uh, that's allow it, and you're going to have mm-hmm. a world government of the Ten King Empire mm-hmm. to enforce it. And this army mm-hmm. in the Ezekiel 38, this is a breakaway branch of those Ten Kings with the groups of nations. Okay. We can talk about who those nations are biblically in in, in a minute. And so... Israel is uh, attacked by this Gog army to destroy them. So when we look at where we are today, um, you have birth pangs that are going to reflect that, and they'll get stronger with that type of larger and larger and larger war that's going to come along. So they have to be in the southern kingdom in the covenant land. More importantly, they have to be in control of Jerusalem. And so that happened in 1967 and because Jerusalem is the epicenter for end-time prophecy. Judah being in Jerusalem is part of that epicenter. So if there is a timetable to start that last generation, mm-hmm. I would say it would be in 1967 when, Jer- when the Judeans took um, Jerusalem back. Now, we don't know how long that generation is. Right. I'm in the Exodus. It talks about 40 years, like 40 mm-hmm. years in the wilderness. The book of Psalms says 70 years. Mm-hmm. And then all life was limited to 120 years in Genesis 6 3. So if that is the timetable, 1967, well, probably 40 years is beyond that. And it's way beyond 1948 or 1947 <laughs> when it actually declared their independence. 70 years would maybe kind of work. Uh, for 1947, but things would have to happen very, very quickly based on that timetable. Or it would place, you know, put put in, into the 2030s for the last seven years that are coming. And if it's 120 years, it could be, you know, a few decades down the road. It doesn't have to hit the mm-hmm. full generation. Right. So things are still mm-hmm. happening within that mm-hmm. fig tree generation. So we're going to mm-hmm. see more of these blow-ups and they're going to get stronger Mm -hmm. and they're worse but eventually you're going to see a similar alliance at least from the eastern part that's going to be part of that gog war that's going to come and try and destroy israel from the face of the earth so you have Uh, like china china will be backing (laughs) it with the strings but they don't show up till armageddon but what you have is persia which is iraq and iran yeah and mm-hmm. a few other countries. And mm-hmm. in ancient times, you had the dark-haired uh, Indo-Aryans, the giant settling into Persia, who produced the Achaemenid kids of the Persian beast empire. And they also settled in the Indus Valley. And that's why Old Persian is a very close language to Sanskrit. And they have the same oh. god names, just slightly different transliterations. Mm-hmm. And so you would include India in on that as well. Really? And India buys their oil and energy mostly from Russia as part of this emerging alliance that's working with Iran and China. The leader of this war is Gog, chief uh, Gog of Magog, chief prince of Meshach. Now, Gog is a, as we talked about, is not in the table of nations. Magog is, uh, and Gog was a giant. <laughs> Mm-hmm. and uh, so Gog shows up and it's described it defined both in the New Testament and the Old Testament of, of Gog as being an end time antichrist figure so there's going to be oh, multiple okay. antichrists and this is the yeah. one antichrist will say he is the antichrist so he can fake his credentials to be Jesus mm-hmm. to come back and introduce his millennium and deceive everybody and that's the uh, that's his counterfeit Armageddon, right? So he needs mm-hmm. that. And so Meshach is the etymological root for the city of Moscow. 
the Indo-Aryans or Scythians that uh, are part of, you might be familiar with the Tartarian, you have to be careful be before and after the flood, which part of the Tartarian empires, but it's the Scythian empires or Tartars, as the Cossacks were known in the Ukraine, that set up the original Kievan Tsar dynasty. And in about 1000 AD, you have Vladimir the Great, expanding the Putyan and bloodline dynasty of czars into Moscow. And they're succeeded by the junior offshoot through an intermarriage in about 1600 by the Romanovs who were wiped off um, by, I think, the Europeans creating communism to destroy a rival uh, bloodline. Okay. Really? Yeah. So now you have Putin, whose name comes from his grandfather that comes out of nowhere, in about 1850. There's no genealogical name beyond that. But what what happened in the, in the Rurka dynasties is that of, of the Ukraine and Kiev, but what happened is if they had children out of wedlock, they okay. would not live in poverty, but they wouldn't be part of the royal inner group, and they wouldn't get the full name. They would get part of the name. Okay. which is where Putin is thought to be come from. Now, as Putin's father moves to St. Petersburg in World War II, which is how he becomes born in Russia. So you have now somebody who believes, and this was in the Russian newspapers, I have an article on Putin as well, if people want it. Um, he believes that he is part of the Putyanin bloodline. Okay. And so he wants his home city back as part of that ancient bloodline and he's building that empire and so that's part of the gog and magog alliance it's the main proponent you have uh, T uh, tagarma which is thought to be turkey today and uh, they're part of nato but they're working more with iran and with russia now i expect they're going to split away from nato down the road my speculation and you have Germany, who also buys all of their energy, for the most part, from Russia. From Russia. And that's yeah. going to come to play. And that's Gomer mm. of that alliance. And so I think mm. you're seeing five of those ten toes of mm. those ten king empires of Daniel mm -hmm. II start to show up. And it's not that they're against the new world order. They just mm -hmm. want a larger role. Mm. Now... Is King of the North, is there any significance to that? Like King of the South towards the end time prophecy? Yeah, there is. I mean, if you, when you get into Daniel 11, which, which, which mm. is what you're referring to, mm. and about at verse 21, you start to see the rise of Antichrist in the first three and a half years, culminating with uh, the abomination at the midpoint. Um, and then what he does in his rule after that. And then Daniel 12, you see another version of the last three and a half years. But within that rise to power after negotiating the covenant, and he rises in the first three and a half years because Babylon and the ten kings are ruling, and it's the ten kings who hand their power over to Antichrist at the midpoint of the last seven years, as Revelation 17 talks about. And, and Antichrist will also overthrow three and replace them with his own puppets um, <laughs> and then distribute their plunder. Uh, there's this massive army that's wiped out before him. And after that, and he takes credit for that, I think, and then he moves his armies into, as Daniel 11 says, into Jerusalem for the abomination. Who is the king of the north? Do we know? It's a different king in different sort of periods, right? Oh, so, okay. Yeah. So you could look at that, that it might be talking about the ten, you know, the king of the north as 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 uh, Rome in the time of Jesus, mm -hmm. right? Because they're the beast empire. Um, it gets a little bit murky what happens after that. Is that after the Roman Empire falls with 10 kings, or is that just talking about all of these 10 kings within the Roman Empire? Uh, but there's a transition to the end time at about verse 20 or 21 that clearly starts talking about this Antichrist figure. It's akin to how Daniel 8 is set up, where it's talking about Alexander 
you know, defeating Persia, becoming a beast empire, and then having things split away, and then transitions into the end time antichrist as an extension out of that so once you see that break you know it goes from that period to as a dual prophecy to the end time let me ask one more question because i want to be respectful with your time um i know the the bible psalms um 37 i believe talks about the um meek inheriting the earth forever what does that mean is that literal yeah, it is. It's 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 the humankind and not the ruling class uh, is going to inherit the earth. And just as angels are sent to be ministers for those who will inherit the earth, that's us. Because in the resurrection, we'll, we will be raised up like angels, even though we have human fathers, uh, through the resurrection and adopted by Jesus through a sacrifice. And that we'll also judge angels for their crimes against humanity in the future time as well. So we're the ones that are described in, in the book of Hebrews as inheriting eternity. We are the meek, the ones that will be resurrected. Versus the ones in, um, in, in the book of Psalms, I'm trying to remember the chapter, I think it's uh, 21, uh, 8 through 10, and it talks about this seed that's going to be removed from humankind in the end time. Um, just as, yeah. And just as Isaiah 25 talks about this branch of the terrible ones, which connects back to giants, are going to be destroyed on a mountain in the end time. Um, and just as Daniel 2 and verse 43 in the King James Version Bible talks about the descendants or the seventh empire of the end time and the ten kings are going to mix their seed with humankind. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so we're talking about this different seed in Psalms 21, this different seed in Daniel, and this branch mm -hmm. of these terrible ones, which are the giants. And if people want to really read a pre, uh, freaky um <laughs> prophecy read ezekiel 32 where it has the terrible ones and that's the hebrew word erit or eritim would be the uh the male plural on it and erit means terrible and i am being ones and these ones are the ones who are in the abyss prison, the pit prison. They're locked in the sides of the abyss, and they're the ones who did terrible things while on the earth. And these ones are talking to Pharaoh, who is another terrible one in that prophecy, who will be going to the abyss prison as well when he is slain. And so these are the terrible ones that... Yeah. Um, are are the the noble elite, and I cover this off again in detail in detail in the new book, and I have a document on Ezekiel thirty two as well. So, yeah, connect all of that together in that language that most people never really say. Well, what the heck are they really talking about with that kind mm. of language? Yeah, it's there for a reason. Mm. I can't wait for your new book. So, when is that supposed to come out? Well, it's already uh, to be printed. It's already in the digital version. Amazon um, will probably has it by now. Whether I don't really? know when they'll. I, I'm not saying they're, they've released it yet. Okay. So, um, what they are, they just posted it up this last week, and I'm scrambling on my website to catch up as well. Uh, <laughs> they have a March 12th release date. What's going on? And there's a paper shortage. There is. Oh. Uh, printer shortage and a labor shortage. <laughs> really? But because it's already in digital format and it just gets automatically transferred into the Kindle, uh, they could release that sooner. So I'm Ooh, trying okay. to get up, up to speed whether or not that comes out a little bit sooner. Um, and the publisher is also thinking that we had to use this date for Amazon because we, you know, we publish a lot of books, or they do, and mm -hmm. that if you miss the date, they punish you. <laughs> Amazon okay. controls over 50% of the market, so they had to do an extended wow. date. So if I get my, if I, if the books get printed 
I'll get mine sooner and I'll make them available. I would presume Amazon would make that book available earlier if the books were available as well. They're already mm -hmm. taking pre-orders off of Amazon and I'm wanting to get set up to take pre-orders myself. I just didn't envision it would be another six months down the road. <laughs> but if the digital version comes out, that would be great. Yeah. And I would recommend in my books that people buy a digital version because uh, it's not that much money. Um, and you may want to keep the other one as, you know, on your shelf. But, you know, I have a digital version of my own book and I use Kindle so I can quickly search keywords and find things yeah. because there's a lot of information in my books. What I do on my okay. website is is I, <laughs> sign, I sell signed copies. So whether or not you live in Canada or the U.S., there's a page for that. And Hawaii is included okay. <laughs> on the U.S., Okay. Uh, and then there's an inter international page for the rest of the world. And so just different freight costs uh, going to each of those locations. So you can get a signed copy okay. from me. And also you can link over to the Kindle version and get it right there. There's just a Kindle icon. You just click on that. And that takes you to Amazon for that link. You can also link over to Amazon.com, Amazon.ca, and BarnesandNoble.com on the icon if you wanted to purchase directly from them and their price will tend to be a little bit lower um, because of the freight costs of me shipping across borders and stuff. I live in Canada. Um, so lots of ways to get, if you want to support me, that's fine. If you want to buy from uh, an online bookstore or through uh, a Barnes and Noble as a, as a, you know, hard copy when it's out there, I'm fine with both. So uh, whatever's best for you. And um, I think that that's probably the easiest way to buy the book, but you can search yourself for other online bookstores if, if you want to buy it from them as well. You won't be able to get the, the Kindle version, but because um, that's Amazon's proprietary digital version, uh, but Okay. But eventually they all end up on Google <laughs> and everything else. So it doesn't take long. <laughs> True. <laughs> True. And what's the best place for people to find you? Your website? Through my website as well or on Facebook under Gary Wayne. And oh, you yeah? can send me a message at Messenger. Really? Okay. Yeah. And there's a group that I'll participate in. It's got my name on it, Gary Wayne and the Genesis 6 Conspiracy. I don't administer it i don't have time to i didn't create yeah. the, I, I didn't create it because i knew i didn't have time but i do uh participate in it i do post in it and i do answer questions there as well so people want to get a hold of me those are the best places and that brings us to the end of another enlightening episode of the sensible hippie podcast I hope you enjoyed this deep dive into the world of giants, bloodlines, and end time prophecy with our esteemed guest, Gary Wayne. I'd like to extend my gratitude to Gary for sharing his invaluable insight and knowledge with us today. It's voices like his that continue to push the boundaries of our understanding of the mysteries in the Bible. Thank you, Gary. And if you found today's episode as thought-provoking as I did, please consider subscribing to the Sensible Hippie Podcast on your favorite podcast platform. And please give me an honest review so others can find this podcast as well. Mahalo for your support. And don't forget to check out Gary Wayne at Genesis6Conspiracy.com. That's Genesis, the number six, conspiracy. Dot com, and you'll find the link in the show notes below. And as we part ways today, remember to keep asking questions, keep exploring, and above all, stay sensible in your pursuit of knowledge. Until the next time, stay sensible and curious. Take care. Bye. take me I just know I'm here for the ride baby there ain't no sense in waiting yeah
here We don't know if we got the time Oh, I'm just a country girl In a real big world You can catch me on 65 Driving to the mountain top I don't make no stops Yeah, this town was once all that I knew I'll never forget my roots I'll never forget my roots Maybe I'll end up in the city Underneath all the flashing lights Maybe I'll be in a new country But when I go to sleep at night Oh, I'm just a country girl In a real big world You can catch me on 65 Driving to the mountain top, I don't make no stops. Yeah, this town was once all that I knew. I'll never forget my roots. 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 There's nothing you can make me do. To ever forget my roots Oh, I'm just a country girl In a real big world You can catch me on 65 Driving to the mountain top I don't make no stops Yeah, this town was once all that I knew I'll never forget my roots I'll never forget my roots I'll never forget my roots